Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. I'll make a few remarks and give you an overview of some of the things we've been doing in Stanford Medicine, and then it'll be my privilege to introduce our panelists, and we'll come up and have a panel discussion, and then at the conclusion, we're going to open everything up for your questions and your feedback. But first, let me say what an honor it is to be here today. I want to thank the organizers. I think this is a wonderful concept, a wonderful uh, group of people to bring together, and we hope that the next hour and a half is meaningful and productive for all of you. So let me just say that uh, before beginning that I think disclosures for us as academic leaders are extremely important, and this is, these are the disclosures of the relationships that I have uh, which are included as a part of my presentation today, that is, the disclosures are. Now, one of the problems that we have in the U.S. healthcare delivery system, it's not unique to the United States, but I have to say that I think it's more manifested in the United States than in, certainly than in any other OECD country. And that is that we almost have the pyramid inverted in terms of thinking about how we can have impact on health. And let me explain what I mean. We know that by far the largest determinants of health are environmental and social factors in accompaniment with behavioral factors. So social, environmental, and behavioral determinants of health account for 60 to 70 percent of the determinants of a person's overall health and well-being. Medical care accounts for certainly a portion, maybe 20 percent or so, and then genetics, maybe 15 to 20 percent. The exact values can vary based upon the study that you read. But if you look, if we were to then plot or discuss the infrastructure and the resources that we devote to these various components, in the United States, by far the most emphasis is on, shall we say, the medical care and the genomic components of health. And I have to say, nowhere is that more manifested than at the leading academic medical centers of the United States, and I would certainly consider Stanford Medicine to be a part of that group of leading academic medical centers. We began to think a few years ago about, well, how can we realign the pyramids, if you will? How can we realign the need with the intellectual resources and the areas of focus that we have within Stanford Medicine? And when you step back and think about it, the areas of, of discipline, the areas of scholarship that have driven advances in genomics that have driven advances in our attempts to cure complex diseases like heart disease and cancer, those areas of focus and scholarship can also be applied much earlier in the course of health and disease. That is, they can be applied to predict and prevent disease in addition to applying them to cure disease once it's occurred. And so we developed the notion that we describe as precision health. Distinguishing it from precision medicine, which I think we've all heard about, precision medicine is about sick care. And certainly, if you or I have cancer or complex heart disease, we for sure want precision medicine. We don't want to be treated in sort of the way a mean, an average person with the disorder would be treated. That is, we don't want to be treated based upon average characteristics of a disease, we want to be treated based upon our individual characteristics of disease. We want, to be, we want our therapies to be personalized and to be tailored to the characteristics of the disease that we have. A good example of this would be the treatment of breast cancer. The treatment of breast cancer is no longer one size fits all. The treatment of breast cancer is tailored to the receptor status of the tumor, it's tailored to the underlying health of the patient, and as a result, the outcomes from the treatment of breast cancer have improved enormously. But we should be taking that same approach to predicting and preventing disease, and not just in trying in, in how we approach 
curing disease once it occurs. The goal of precision health, therefore, is to maintain health. And the whereas the goal, in other words, the goal of precision health is about health care, whereas the goal of precision medicine is about sick care. And we need both. We absolutely need both. The three components of precision health, as described on this slide, are to predict, prevent, and cure disease precisely, but really in that order, with a lot more emphasis on prediction and prevention than we've typically seen, at least in the United States and in our academic discovery-based and research-based medical centers. Now, digital health, which is the topic of today's panel, plays a critically important role in being able to predict and prevent disease, and yes, certainly in being able to cure disease once diseases occur. There are a lot of different ways to think about digital health, and it's such a rapidly evolving space that any categorization we give today is going to change in the future. But here's some broad categories that I've found to be useful. We can think of two fundamental pillars underneath the overall heading of digital health. That is consumer-facing devices and technologies and AI machine learning enabled analytics. Consumer-facing devices consist of wearables, smartphones, anything that you and I can use to monitor our health. Whereas the analytics component involves machine learning, it involves access to huge databases in order to glean information from vast repositories of data. Now, of course, these two pillars of devices and analytics are not separate. They're integrally, integrally related because you can gather all the data you want from devices and if you haven't integrated that data with other data in order to derive information from it, then you really don't have much actionable information. You really haven't advanced the knowledge or understanding of prediction and prevention. But I think these broad categories have some utility in helping to organize our discussion about digital health and what it offers for the immediate and intermediate term future of health care and health and well-being. Let me give you a few examples of the way we're implementing a strategy devoted towards precision health at Stanford Medicine. We have a center that goes by the acronym of FINE, Precision Health and Integrated Diagnostics. And this center is attempting to develop new diagnostics that can be used completely in the background. One of the problems with digital devices, wearables or apps that go on our smartphone that are related to health, one of the challenges is that people may use them for the first three or four months that they have them, but then the utilization tends to fall off. What we really need to have is a way of monitoring our health a way of diagnosing impending disease at an early stage that operates completely in the background, that doesn't require our active participation. A good analogy would be every time you or I fly on an airplane, the jet engines on that plane are being monitored hundreds of times a minute and are beaming information down to earth about the performance of the engine. Now ordinarily, that data that's being sent back down to Earth is not at the awareness level of the pilots of the plane. But it is being monitored, it is being tracked, and if there is a significant problem during a flight in the performance of an engine, then an alert is issued to the flight crew. And the routine maintenance of the jet engines increasingly that maintenance is being planned based upon the information that's being gathered in real time about the performance of the engines. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we had something analogous to that for our health? That is, that we monitor our health in the background, our health was being monitored in the background, and we were alerted if there was a problem. That's one of the goals of FIND through development of technologies like a smart toilet or a smart mirror, things that can operate in the background and give us indications 
about changes in our health status that might prompt us to take action. Another project that I'd like to describe briefly to you is a collaboration that exists between faculty at Stanford and Verily, which was formerly Google Life Sciences uh, before Google reorganized and became Alphabet, with Verily being one of the companies in Alphabet. You can think of Project Baseline as being the Framingham study on steroids. Most of you here today probably are aware of the Framingham study. We've probably learned more about heart disease from the Framingham study than any single study ever conducted. It was started now 60 years ago. It was smart, started with a fairly small cohort of patients. Now, second generation of the original participants in the study are enrolling in the study. It's from the Framingham study that we got information about the risk factors of cholesterol and other lipids and high blood pressure in the occurrence and the instance of coronary artery disease. But Framingham was and continues to this day to be a fairly simple study in terms of the actual data gathered. What we're trying to do with baseline is to gather a whole lot more data to track people longitudinally and from that data be able to look for patterns that portend of the future development of disease. Ba baseline is therefore a longitudinal cohort study. It will enroll initially 10,000 people in a demographically balanced way. And pretty much everything you and I can imagine about the health of these 10,000 people is going to be measured and then tracked. Verily developed its own wearable specifically for this study. We're hoping that over the course of time, will, and it may not take very long, we'll start to see some early indicators that can then be fed back into the development of diagnostic criteria and early interventions that'll help to maintain health and well-being. And finally, I want to finish up by describing the Apple Heart Study. This is a collaboration between cardiologists and other faculty at Stanford and Apple and it used watch to detect arrhythmia. The most common arrhythmia, of course, being atrial fibrillation. As you probably know, atrial fibrillation is oftentimes only diagnosed when a complication occurs, like a stroke or other cardiac or a cardiac event. And we don't actually even know what the true incidence and prevalence of atrial fibrillation is because very frequently it's silent and in the background. Since we don't know the incidence and prevalence, it's hard for us to develop therapeutic guidelines based upon evidence. If we had a way of detecting atrial fibrillation when it occurs and of alerting people and encouraging them to seek medical attention, we should be able to prevent a lot of the downstream consequences of atrial fibrillation. I won't go through all of the findings of, of the Apple Heart Study. I think. Uh, those will be coming out uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. The results of the Apple Heart Study were presented at the American Cardi College of Cardiology earlier this year. Suffice it to say that what we showed is first we enrolled over 400,000 people in about an eight month period in this entirely virtual clinical trial. The people enrolled in this study never came to a bricks and mortar facility. They gave consent online. And then watch in accompaniment with their iPhone was used to track both their activity level as well as their heart rate and rhythm and to issue an alert if they were experiencing what might be atrial fibrillation. If they received an alert, if an individual enrolled in the study received an alert, then he or she was given information about how to contact American Well, a telehealth provider, American Well then would explain what the alert might mean, would give the person the, the option of wearing a strip patch EKG for 10 days, sending that back in, and having that interpreted by our cardiologists. A few of the findings. First, as you might imagine, it was extremely important that there not be a lot of spurious alerts. Imagine, you know, if this becomes widely used and, and a large percentage of the people wearing or using the app uh, are alerted that they may have AFib and 
all of a sudden you have thousands of people coming into the delivery system. That wasn't the case. Less than 1% of people enrolled in the study received a notification. For those who did receive a notification, 50% of them went on to the next step of actually wearing uh, a patch uh, EKG strip. And for those people wearing the strip, 84% of them who were thought to have AFib based upon the algorithm in the watch and in the phone actually were shown to have AFib based upon the definitive gold standard, which was the, the EKG being recorded with the patch. We think those are encouraging results. Still, there's a lot more to be done to follow up on those results. But I think it's an early indication of the power of these consumer-facing devices and how, when accompanied with analytics based upon large amounts of data, we can really change the way we predict and prevent disease, and in so doing, really improve overall health and well-being.